This episode is brought to you by my Fertility Awareness Mastery online self-study program. Learn fertility awareness from the comfort of your own home at your own pace for a fraction of the cost. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash mastery for details. That's fertilityfriday.com slash mastery. This is a Fertility Friday podcast, episode number 384. Welcome to the Fertility Friday podcast, your source for information about the fertility awareness method and all things fertility. I'm your host, Lisa Hendrickson-Jack. I'm the author of The Fifth Vital Sign and the Fertility Awareness Mastery Charting Journal. I'm a certified fertility awareness educator and holistic reproductive health practitioner with nearly 20 years of experience teaching women to connect to their fifth vital sign through menstrual cycle charting, balancing hormonal health, and optimizing the menstrual cycle without hormones. I'm outspoken about hormonal birth control and its impact on fertility and overall health because you have the right to know how your body works and how artificial hormones disrupt that natural process. I host live coaching programs to help you achieve optimal fertility and health because it's important to have healthy menstrual cycles regardless of whether or not you want to have babies. I'm also a wife and mother of two beautiful boys. I know, I know, I'm a busy girl, but I managed to fit it all in. This podcast is designed to empower you to take full control of your cycles, your fertility, and your overall health. And I'm so excited that you're here with us today. Today, I'm welcoming back Amy Rao to the show. For those of you who aren't familiar with Amy's work, she is a renowned women's health and fertility expert, celebrity acupuncturist and coach, and the best-selling author of the books, Chill Out and Get Healthy, Yes, You Can Get Pregnant, and Body Belief. And in today's episode, we are talking about her latest book, which is The Egg Quality Diet, a clinically proven 100-day fertility diet to balance hormones, reduce inflammation, improve egg quality, and optimize your ability to get and stay pregnant. You can tune into the previous episodes that I recorded with Amy, episode 339, as well as episode 76. And in today's episode, we really focus on some of Amy's top strategies to improve egg quality, support egg quality, and of course, improve your overall chances of conception. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump into today's episode. So I'm really excited to have Amy Raup back on the podcast. Welcome to the show. Oh, thank you, Lisa. So excited to be here. Well, thank you for coming. I feel like this might be episode three. I feel like this might be I think third it's episode three. Yeah. It's crazy. <laughs> we, I feel like we, we met when you released, yes, you can get pregnant. And that was so long ago. It's just so interesting to see how you've flourished and grown and how many books you've written since then. <laughs> but congratulations on your most recent book, The Egg Quality Diet. I'm really excited to talk to you about it because of course, I mean, this is a hot topic on so many women's minds, so many women who are listening to the podcast, so many of my clients, especially women who are kind of edging up into that 30, 35 to 40 range when we're trying to conceive. So let's just dive right in. You know, why did you decide to write this book now? Yeah, I think because I kept seeing the same thing over and over again, and and I'll take some responsibility for it myself with my book, Yes, You Can Get Pregnant, where I think, you know, the diets that, you know, like the diet I reference in Yes, You Can Get Pregnant and some of the other fertility diets that I see out there are great. And I think they're awesome and they work for a lot of women, but then there is, I think a growing number of women that the diet might not be specific enough. And what I, so what I started to see is, you know, when I have my new coaching clients or my associates have coaching clients, or there's people in our clinics and we always collect food diaries. It's just a common thing we do because we like to really connect the dots for our our clients and, and really see what people are eating. Because I'll hear the general thing of like, oh, I'm following the diet. Like I'm doing the diet. And yes, you can't get pregnant. I'm doing the diet. You know, I'm doing the diet. Or I eat paleo or I eat Mediterranean, whatever. I'm doing the diet. And then I collect the food diary and they are not eating enough vegetables. They are not eating enough protein. They're not eating enough fat. They're eating too many processed refined. They might be organic. They might be gluten-free, but too many processed refined grains. And they're still just not getting the nutrition that they need. And so... I just felt like I wanted to really come in and simplify things. And and as I was telling you before we started recording, 
that a lot of the information that's in the equality diet, I was already using with my coaching clients. Like I'd already kind of created this style of a diet, this elimination diet, because I started to see how effective it was probably four years ago, right? I started to use it very often in my clinic and with my coaching clients. And so I had created basically like a 60 day eating plan or a 30 day eating plan for most of like the new clients that, that came to me and to my associates. And so it just hit me one day that I wanted to make a hundred days of a menu that was macronutrient balanced. That was basically just laying out like, this is what you need to eat every day. Here's your shopping list. Here's your menus. Here's your recipes. And, and just simplify it because, you know, it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming all the information that we're inundated with of eat this, don't eat that, do this for your hormones, do this for your fertility. And so I felt really inspired and particularly inspired with this type of diet. So it's an elimination diet, which I know, you know, because I just have seen the most profound impact on women's health because every single body is different. So what works for one woman might not work for somebody else, but I think the macronutrients still are the same. If we're trying to achieve hormone balance or fertility, the macros are still the same. And then we get to kind of, but we eliminate and then we can add back in and see how our body responds based on our symptoms. So I feel like I'm in this book, I'm empowering women to figure out not just the right fertility diet, but their fertility diet, like what is right for your body and your hormones. Mm -hmm. Well, okay. So I want to ask some questions yes. about egg quality because I mean, it's up yes. for debate depending on which circles you roll in. So I've heard people say, well, there's nothing you can do to improve egg quality. It's directly based on the age of the person, which of course I don't completely agree with, but there's yes. still some truth in that. So could you yeah. just tell us a little bit about what can we do um, or your perspective on improving egg quality and what are the limits of what we can do also? Yeah. I mean, listen, there is, I actually have a section in the book, right? But my doctor told me there is no hope with my own eggs. I think there is truth that as far as we know, our ovarian reserve diminishes as we age, right? There is some interesting research that shows we might actually have our ovarian stem cells and maybe we do make more eggs as we get older, but we don't know that to be fact and I don't want to like mislead anybody. So our ovarian reserve does decline as we age 100,000%, right? And at some point we never run out of eggs. We still have like over a hundred or even a thousand, some people say, of eggs left even when we're in menopause. So we still have eggs even when we're in menopause, which I think is something really important for everyone to know. And it's more about one thing I think is important to remember is regardless of your age, it's about quality, not quantity, right? We're not looking to make hundreds of babies. We're looking to make maybe one or two. And so when we think about egg quality, the egg quality diminishes just as any other quality of any other cell in our body diminishes as we age and aging, you know, takes a toll on the body, but there is a way we could age better. And that's really what I try to drive home with my clients. So women though, say who are in their thirties, not even in their forties can often be told that their egg quality is really poor. And when I see something like that, I find it very frustrating because basically the, the quality of our eggs are impacted by what the research shows and, and what I've come to find out clinically is, is really the level of inflammation in our body and how well our body detoxes or like cleans itself out, if you will, you know, how well it, it manages all of the assaults from our diet and from our lifestyle. And so some of that is up to our genetics, right? Some of us are just born better adapted than others at, at managing environmental toxins or bad food choices or pesticides in, in our food and, and things of that nature. And, and others are better at it. But what we do know and what the research shows is that the quality of eggs is actually not as dependent on age as it is on environmental factors and lifestyle. And so basically, if you are a woman who is, I do think you don't even have to be right necessarily ovulating, right? You know that we can help restore the ovulation. Like, and I'm talking about a woman who's still in her fertile years, but if there are eggs in your ovaries and your body is going through the process of menstruating and ovulating, or with some assistance, it can do that that you have the ability to improve the cellular health of every single cell in your body, including the ones in your ovaries, which are your eggs. 
Mm-hmm. Well, that makes a lot I, of sense. Of course. But I think we don't think about like, I think the piece that like is missing here is like, yes, as we get older, the ovarian reserve diminishes. And yes, as we get older, we should get less and less healthy, right? I mean, those are kind of like the, the facts of life. We know that. But we also know these people that are like aging gracefully, age beautifully, you know, like find balance, like extend your lifespan. Like there's all this conversation or or you can heal from cancer or you can reverse heart disease. You can heal diabetes. So why can't we apply that same thing to a woman in her fertile years and tell her that she can actually improve the quality of her eggs? Like we're not thinking about epigenetics. We're not thinking about disease reversal in other categories. Like when we say that, oh, sorry, you're 35. Yeah. Your chances have now gone down, you know, one in three of you are going to, you know, not be able to get pregnant. And then I think the biggest thing that no one's talking about when it's coming to egg quality or fertility is we're not addressing these coexisting health conditions that are going on that are causing our body to not feel healthy and safe and capable of procreating. So, you know, I think a woman's hormonal, you know, her, her reproductive system, if you will, is when it's in top tip top working order, it is and the ability to reproduce is, is a luxury. You know, that's the body saying I have enough to make another human, right? I'm so well oiled. And, and the younger we are, the more we can get away with. So as we get older, yes, we're more compromised, but there's a lot we can do to, I think, manipulate the machinery to get it to function better. Well, and another question along those lines, I feel like, because I I talk a lot about sperm on the podcast and I feel like with sperm, you get more of a specific parameter and marker. You know what I mean? So with sperm, you get this count and you get Mm -hmm. the morphology number and you get, Mm -hmm. like, it's very satisfying. Um, If you, if you're working with a client, you you know, you do some things to improve the sperm quality. You You know, numbers. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So share with us just a little bit about, about your perspective on that. There's a lot of women who are are listening, who might be at some point in the fertility journey. Maybe they've been told that they have diminished ovarian reserve or, you know, their AMH numbers are off or their antral follicle count and, you know, all of those things. And tell us your thoughts on all of those kind of markers, but also what are some of the specific kind of parameters that you look at to see, like, is this working? The specific parameters I look at to see if it's working is um, I have it in the book. It's called the kinks in your body questionnaire. And you might look at it and think that has nothing to do with fertility, but I feel like I say this all day, every day. Forgive me if you've heard me say it before, but your body is an extension of your health. And so I use the symptom questionnaire. It's, it's in the book. It's called the kinks in your body questionnaire. Things like acne and bloating and brain fog and cold sores, constipation. Like I have a whole list of symptoms in the book. Like as far as even, you know, intense PMS symptoms or lack of cervical mucus or anovulation, right? Those are all signs to me that, and to you, I know that things are not in working order. And so we have room for improvement is what I would say, right? And that is what I use. So when I have women that are saying to me, oh, I've been, you know, I'm working with you or I read your book, I'm following your diet, I'm still not pregnant. It's like, okay, so something still is not in working order and we need to dive deeper and figure that out. And that is kind of where this, the quality diet was birthed out of is, is those cases that like, it still wasn't working. It still wasn't enough. And so a lot of times I'll say consistency and frequency is what gets us there. So some women need longer than others on protocols but some women need even finer tuning, tweaking. And, but to me, the body speaks to us when it's ready. And then sometimes there might be real deal structural issues or real deal sperm issues that we need some assistance in, in this department to get to make a baby actually. And I'm, I'm all for that. I'm all for getting assistance too. But for, and for men too, you can see it. Men with really poor sperm parameters are typically not in the best of health or they're not managing their health as good as they can, or they're not sleeping enough, or they drink too much caffeine, right? Like those are the things that we see, it, we change those things on them, the sperm gets better. With women, it's harder. We can't really see whether or not egg quality is improving unless we're actually doing IVF, right? And we're retrieving those eggs and we're fertilizing them. But we're also, when, once we fertilize them, we have to think about what sperm is doing to impact that egg quality as well, right? So it's not just on the woman and on the egg. It's, it's on now the sperm as well. But what we do see and can see is, I mean, first of all, FSH, AMH, antral follicle count will all and can all change month to month. And they will all change. We know 
for a fact in the literature that there are more fertile months than there are not, right? And so I bet you if you tested all the women on the more fertile months of the year, you would see higher antral follicle counts, lower AMH, and, high, and I mean, higher AMH and lower FSH. We, but we know, at least I know clinically, and I'm sure you know, is those numbers change month to month all the time. You know, antral follicle count gives us the best, I think, indication of what we have to work with. So how many eggs are left in your ovaries? How many are your bo- is your body trying to kind of recruit and bring up this cycle? But AMH is basically a, a reflection from what I understand now as we're learning more about it. It's a reflection of that month's ovarian potential. It is not an overall reflection of like how many eggs you have left. Same with FSH. It, it's very dependent on estrogen, right? So also really dependent on the cycle day that you tested on. So those numbers are, are not at all good depictions. And then I've also had plenty of clients that in, in a laboratory setting, their egg quality looks like it's crap, but then they go and get pregnant naturally with a healthy child, you know? So I don't know that we have real good measurements of quality of eggs other than if we look at the overall health picture of the woman. And that, that's how I was trained, right? Chinese medicine is, we don't, focus so much on fertility we focus on like what does your period look you know so many of the things you talk about like do you see cervical mucus how many days do you see it what's your sex drive what's the color of your blood do you get bad pms and then overall health pictures too do you sleep enough are you happy what's your poop like that all really gives me a very good idea of what's going on inside the body and you can extrapolate from there how healthy are the cells is everybody happy is everybody thriving and that, to me, is a pretty good indicator of what's going to happen from a fertility perspective. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, I love that. And it really does align with the way that I've been trained to look at the cycle as a marker of health as well, because yeah. these indirect markers can give you a ton of information. And on the topic of AMH... It's a fifth vital sign, like somebody says. Who's that uh, girl? <laughs> Who's <is> that girl? <laughs> um, but I wanted to touch on AMH for a second. I don't want to go like on a tangent forever, but with AMH... What I find to be really interesting, because I've pulled some research about it and kind of taken a look at it, it would appear as though like there's a lot of, I mean, there's a ton of research that's been done on AMH, but AMH is uh, the levels are more strongly correlated with the chances of IVF success and successful egg retrieval compared to natural conception. So there's a lot of studies that would suggest that it's not like, so that's, it's exactly what you said, Amy, when you said like, you can have a client that has these markers and their doctor's telling them, oh, nothing's going to happen. And except that the markers aren't actually correlated to natural conception. No. And, and they, they're only correlated to, like you said, success with IVF medication, because what they care about, and, and, and bless them, they're doing great work out there and they're moving the ball forward for a lot of girls, but they care about how many eggs are they going to get out of you because the, the more to work with, the better, right? You know, and that's not how nature is. Nature selects one. One becomes the dominant one. Nature is really smart at that. So nature doesn't give a crap about what your AMH or your FSH is that, that month, right? It's, it's, but they use it. It's the only real parameter they have, you know, although I think some of the better fertility doctors really use antropological count as like the leading parameter these days. But it's about your your response to fertility stimulation meds. That's what those numbers matter about. Because if you have a high FSH, you're going to be, quote unquote, a poor responder, right? And so IVF might not be worth your investment because you might only get one. But then if that's the case, just find someone who's going to do a natural IVF. If you really feel like you need IVF or if you're you know, a bit more mature in age and, and maybe IVF will get you there faster, I strongly recommend natural IVF or very low medication IVF. And and then you can still, you'll still be in the game and and probably have some success. That's how they're trained because they're fertility doctors, right? They're trained in helping women get pregnant in a laboratory setting, right? And so those numbers matter to them. They don't matter to us so much. I've had girls with super low AMHs get pregnant naturally and, and have been told they need donor eggs. I've had girls with super high AMHs and they can't seem to get a healthy egg. You know what I mean? So it's just, I don't know that those numbers matter. 
Yeah. I mean, bottom line for the listener, when you're looking at natural conception, those AMH numbers, it's yeah. the, in the, even in the actual peer yes. review literature, they're not yes. supposed to be used to be predictive of a natural conception. So it's like rant over, yeah. but I feel like that's something that's so tragic because I'm sure you've experienced I it know. so many times in your practice where these women are just devastated and really totally scared because of what they've been told. But again, it, it should be put into context. I wanted Always. to shift yeah. your, cause I could talk about that all day, but I wanted to ask you, <laughs> Because I feel like with egg quality, there's a trend, obviously, to really focus on supplements. And I mean, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. There's a lot of supplements that have a lot of research behind them that really do improve or, you know, reduce the oxidative stress and et cetera, et cetera. But you're focusing on diet and you mentioned inflammation. And so I would love just to hear more about the approach, because I feel like this is actually not typically what you hear when people are talking about egg quality. Well, our, I always quote our good friend, Nicole Jardim, when she said sometime at some point, and she might've gotten it from somebody else, you can't out supplement a crappy diet. I mean, I think supplements play a really big role. I'm all for them. There's definitely, you know, a, a, a good amount of them in my arsenal, but you have to start with the diet first, because if you are not absorbing your nutrition, if there is so much inflammation in your body or your gut is in dysbiosis and you're not absorbing your food, you are not absorbing your vitamins and you are wasting your money. And so you could take all the CoQ10 in the world or all, you know, everybody's into the NAD plus now or whatever, fish oil, even like what I recommend, liver pills, you could take all of it. But if you can't absorb, if you're not absorbing your food, you're you're not going to absorb your your supplements. And so you have to start with the basics and get your gut health in order. You have to reduce inflammation. And those supplements are complementary. They will definitely be helpful. Like I'm a huge fan of, of fish oil for reducing inflammation. I think it's super powerful. And I really like it because it's pretty much food, right? But I would prefer if if women were eating, you know, eight to 12, 12 servings of good quality fish each week. And then that seems hard to come by. Right. And everybody's concerned about mercury and all the things. Right. So there's just layers and layers. But we need to start with a diet first. And, and in the book, too, that's how I do it, where I, I, you know, I'm not saying I don't mention I don't talk much about supplements until, you know, about week eight or something like that, where then I layer in, you know, there's additional resources that come with the book on the website. And I, and I start talking about supplements. But it's really because I want to just drive home. Like food is the primary medicine. You really do need to start with food. And even, you know, oh, and then I'm taking herbs and I'm an herbalist. I'm a huge fan of herbs. I'm a huge fan of supplements, but I just see it with clients. Like I just had a, a case review with one of my associates yesterday and this client is in such, she's just, her gut is just so, she's not digesting her food. She's constipated. She's bloated all the time. You know, she just feels terrible most of the time. And she's on a slew of supplements from all these different functional docs who love and respect them, but no one has, and I just said, we got to remove them. We got to take them all out. We got to work on her diet. Like let's get her to like, see what feels good. And then we can slowly add them back in. And that's what I'm a fan of is like, let's take everything out. Let's see how your body does all on its own. And we're not taking forever, you know, take them out for a week or two and then add them back in because we all do need extra support. We know our soil is compromised. We know the phytonutrients in our foods are compromised. We do need extra support, but it's a waste of your money if you're not digesting them. And so I think we have to start with food first and food really is the basis of, of health and should be the first medicine. Well, and, and then you should take food-based supplements in my opinion from there. I mean, some of them are great, you know, like the CoQ10s and all that, like, absolutely. There's great research. We see it. We see melatonin helping. We see CoQ10 helping. We see fish oil helping. I mean, I, I actually quoted in, in the book, because fish oil is such a powerful reducer of inflammation a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acids prolongs reproductive function into advanced maternal age. I mean, there's research to support that. So a diet rich in omega-3 fatty acid, but you could add in extra fish oil to get what you need to get. So we, we know these things, but again, if you're missing your mark and what if you're taking fat soluble vitamins and not eating enough fat, I don't know you're going to absorb the vitamins, right? It's a waste of money. Well, so talk to us then about, so you mentioned it's an elimination diet. So just kind of take us through, like, what are the key foods here? You know, what's the formula? Well, the formula is, so that's the other thing too, in the research showing that, and you probably see this too, if we go too low on carbohydrates, obviously I think it can impact ovulation significantly. And if 
too low on protein, I definitely see that too impacting the you know reproductive function. But there's some interesting research showing the right macronutrient ratios, like about 45 or you know, and I say always say plus or minus so a couple percentage points. So not I don't want this to become a super fixated, you have to measure and weigh every single thing you're eating, because I think that's not healthy either. But about 45% fat about 25% carbs and 30% protein seems to be kind of the magic bullet for fertility. There was one doctor who did his own study in his own clinic where he assessed what women were eating in his clinic. And he found that they were on average having about 60% carbohydrates. And I think 60% carbs, I'm just trying to remember. And I think it was 20 or 30% protein maybe about 20% protein, but when he shifted them to more fat and less carbs, the success rate quadrupled in his, this was a fertility clinic, but these were women were having consistent IVF failures and no blastocysts being made and then reduced carbs, increased fat protein, I think went up a little bit, all of a sudden, boom. So, and then what I've seen over the years, again, this is clinical experience talking is like the general I think paleo Mediterranean style diet works for a lot of women, like like I said, but what I started to see is women that were maybe having more than one miscarriage or had been trying to conceive for a couple of years and things still weren't working and they really were following the diet or they have a coexisting health issue like an autoimmune condition like Hashimoto's or celiac or endometriosis or PCOS, even though we know they're not technically autoimmune conditions, but they act similarly. Um, and then maybe some IVF fail- failures, things like that, like they weren't genetically normals that I found if I went a little more aggressive with reducing inflammation with like elimination style diet, and we didn't just remove gluten and dairy and soy, but we took out things like nuts and seeds. And again, these are all short term. We're not eliminating forever. This is like a 30 day elimination diet. Then we start adding things back in to see how your body reacts nightshades, legumes, grains, processed vegetable oils, uh, the other obvious ones like coffee and alcohol. We removed all that. Although I'm still, I still think you can have this stuff in your diet if you respond well to it. But if we remove all of it for say a 30 to 45 day period, and then slowly add things back in. And while we're doing that, we're just eating basically good quality animal protein, either fish or meat. And we're eating six to eight servings of good quality vegetables. And we're eating a couple tablespoons of fat every day or fat rich foods like avocado and olive oil and ghee and coconut oil. We start to heal the gut. I love bone broth too. You know, we start to heal the gut. We start to reduce inflammation and we give the body time to heal and recover from all the assaults from the previous dietary uh, foods and stressors. And maybe if, if a woman wasn't eating organic and pesticides and, and then we start to slowly reintroduce and we, we were marking symptoms every single week through the diet to see like, Oh, Oh, I, I had almonds and I actually got like really bad acid reflux. And so, I mean, I, there's a very specific way to reintroduce and a, a very specific way to watch for reactions when you're reintroducing. And I go over all that in the book, but then you start to take note, okay, that might be a trigger food for inflammation for me. And like some of my girls, it's, it's lentils. Some of my girls, it's sesame seeds. Some of my girls, it's almonds. Some of my girls, it's not gluten, but it's quinoa. You know what I mean? You just don't know. And that's why I think the elimination aspect is so important. So you can go and remove these things. And and then you're still eating a very nutrient dense, calorically rich diet that will alone, even if you just stayed on that basic diet, which is kind of like phase three is what I call it in, in, in this book, you're getting everything you need to make a baby and to live a healthy life. You're not deprived. Just popping into today's episode to tell you a little bit about the show sponsor, Saturate. One of my top recommendations for women coming off birth control, looking to balance hormones or preparing for pregnancy is finding a way to incorporate liver regularly into the diet. So why liver? Well, liver is one of the most nutrient dense foods available. It's rich in folate, choline, vitamin B12, iron, vitamin A, selenium, zinc, coenzyme Q10, and I could go on, but I'll stop. But unless you grew up eating it, many of my clients have a hard time loving the taste. 
and that's where Saturate comes in. Saturate A Plus liver capsules contain 100% Australian grass fed and finished beef liver, freeze dried, and 100% pure, so no fillers, no preservatives, or any of that other junk. Head over to fertilityfriday.com slash liver today and enter coupon code Fertility Friday for a 5% discount off your order. That's fertilityfriday.com slash liver. Now let's jump back into today's episode. Well, so I have a question for you. Yeah. (laughs) Over the years, I have never actually done a podcast episode on optimizing a vegan diet for fertility or, you know, et cetera. And I get a little bit of pushback every now and then and a couple of negative reviews like, well, this podcast doesn't, it's not for vegetarians and vegans, et cetera. So, I mean, it's, it's always a controversial topic. Um, What I always say is that, well, I'm basing it on the menstrual cycle. So regardless of your diet, I'm going to look at the menstrual cycle to see if it's healthy. So we both know there's plenty of omnivores who do not have healthy cycles. Um, But how do you address that question? Because obviously you stated that um, animal protein and vegetables as being necessary. Well, I say two things. Like I, I do think the diet should be more vegetables than protein. I mean, than animal protein, right? I'm talking a couple ounces, a couple times a day, but and and I do think vegetables should lead the way for all of our diets. I don't think majority of the food diaries I see most women get maybe four servings of vegetables a day. If that's a, like a really good diet, you know, and we really need to get six to eight, right? When it comes to vegetarians and vegans, I just have not clinically seen it work. I think the younger you are, you might be able to get away with it. I think if you're soaking and sprouting your nuts, your seeds, your beans, your grains and you're eating enough fat, you could do it. I tell a lot of women who come to me and ask, I say, can I get you to eat eggs? Most of them will say, yeah, can I get you to eat ghee? Okay. Okay. So I think we could do that. And then would you, would you do fish or would you do some fish broth? And it just depends on the person. So, but yeah, so I'm usually manipulating the vegetarians or the vegans into eating something that gives them the nutrient density. It's just that the plants are really hard to get what we need. Like we need those B vitamins and we need that fat and it's really hard and choline. It's so hard to get that from plant sources alone. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, and and we know that from like, from our perspective, right. We know what nutrients the body wants and needs to have an optimal menstrual cycle. And, and a lot of vegetarians and vegans are not, and then some of them are, and it's amazing. I I credit them because it's a lot of work. They are soaking and sprouting kind of everything they eat. And I do think they can get more out of it, but I also like to look at genetics because a lot of people just aren't genetically made to extract like the omegas from plant sources. They need actual fish sources. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. I mean, one of the things I do with pretty much all of my clients is, you know, go down to the basics. So we really know it's like, what are the ingredients to make a cake? So it's like, what are the ingredients to make a healthy menstrual cycle? Well, you need to have your estrogen and progesterone in optimal Mm -hmm. quantities. And what do we need in order for our body to actually make those hormones? We first of all need enough energy, right? But fat plays a really important role, animal fat, unfortunately, or unfortunately, depending on your perspective on that and protein as well. And I mean, everyone is different. So you could certainly argue that in my practice, if I see somebody who is vegetarian and wanting to conceive, they're coming to me because they probably haven't conceived in the time frame that they That's wanted. Exactly it. So I'm seeing the individuals who are having a hard time with it. So there's certainly an argument to be made that we're not seeing the vegetarians, yeah, we're not seeing the health, the vegetarians that go on and get pregnant. And I think we're seeing the ones that come to us. And I say that a lot too. Like if, you are seeking my advice, then what you're currently doing is not working. Are you willing to try something different? Are you open to the idea of trying something different? You can go back to being a vegetarian or a vegan when you're done having your babies. That's fine. Like I'm not against those decisions, but when you're asking me for my advice, like just like with you to, to regulate a menstrual cycle or to get pregnant, this is what I've seen work, you know, cause you're coming to me with, with a challenge and I want to help you solve for that. And yeah, it's usually that, but there are women out there, sure, who are vegetarians and vegans and they can do it. And that's amazing. And there are women out there who eat a carnivore diet and they do it. And that's amazing. And, you know, there's women out there who eat soy and gluten and dairy and they do it. And that's amazing. But then there 
the women that we are calling in are not those women. And so we, you know, we're trying to help them solve for the problems. Well, and can you share any stories to kind of make it more personal of what a person could expect? So like, if you've kind of seen that before and after and what kind of transformations you've seen on the one hand, it's complicated. You wrote a book about it, but on the other hand, it's generally straightforward what you're talking about. Yeah, I think it's really straightforward the last couple of weeks. Right. So I had a woman who I think she's done like six IVFs unsuccessfully. Nothing has been genetically normal. She's in her 30s. She has a decent reserve. She responds well to meds, not getting pregnant naturally for like two years. She was following like my yes, you can get pregnant diet. And, you know, then when I collected the food diary, she was in that category of like kind of a lot of carbs, not enough fat and definitely not enough protein. Um, And the carbs were from like her gluten-free muffin with like peanut butter in the morning, you know, that kind of stuff, even though peanut butter is not on my, yes, you can get a pregnant diet, but that's whatever that happens. And so we changed things up. We got her to do more veg and better quality fats and, and protein and uh, better quality carbohydrates. And, and like she had chronic eczema and dry scalp. She had really bad anxiety. You know, this is all off the top of my head, but like I'm picturing her and her nails would break. Her hair was thin. You know, she had really low vitamin D, like all of these things. And so we changed the diet. That all starts to shift. And then, you know, we did it for about three months and she goes in for another trade bowl and she got, I forget the numbers. I think they retrieved 12, I think nine fertilized. So it was already a better fertilization rate. But anyway, she got five genetically normal embryos. Now she has never once gotten a normal and let alone, like, I don't even think she had more than three that were ever sent off for genetic testing. And that's just like one case. You know, I've had multiple cases of women who've had several failed fertility treatments and then follow something like this. And, you know, you, what you see first is you see the symptoms changing. You just see they get healthier and healthier, like on all the levels, you know, whether it's bad hormonal symptoms or it's gastrointestinal symptoms or it's mental, emotional anxiety, sleep issues, things start to shift. They start to feel better in their bodies. Some women gain weight, some women lose weight. I really just let that, like, I leave that up to the gods. I think, I think the the body knows exactly what it needs to do. And then you see them either get naturally pregnant or they go in and they have some successful fertility treatments after, you know, some of these girls, it's years of failed fertility treatments, like one case. And she was really the impetus for the deeper dive into this diet for me, she was seeing me around the time when I wrote body belief, which was all about autoimmunity. And she does not have an autoimmune condition, but she has an endometriosis. She'd been trying to conceive by the time I met her for six and a half years. She was now in her early forties and she never was pregnant. She's never had a successful fertility treatment. She's never once made it to an IVF transfer. She did 20 some odd fertility treatments. Nothing ever worked. I was like her six acupuncturist. She was with a bunch of functional docs. Like, I mean, you name it. She'd seen everybody. She had the resources. She worked with every single person she could possibly work with. And she was eating really clean and healthy. She was one of those people. She was paleo, but she would soak her beans and sprout things. But when she came to me, she still had a, she still was not pregnant. But B, she still had migraines. She still had bad PMS. She still had light periods. She still had joint pain. She still had IBS like symptoms on occasion. And I just kind of did like a a real cleanup of her diet. And she was eating these like soaked, fermented, whatever, green lentils on a regular basis. And she loved tahini. I told this story earlier today. And I took both of them out of her diet because I was like, let's just see. And symptoms started to get better. And then, I mean, you know where this is going. It's like three months, four months later, she was still doing mini IVF. So very low dose meds. She was a quote unquote poor responder. She's now in her early forties. I thought she was working with a great fertility clinic. They canceled a retrieval because the egg wasn't growing fast enough for them. They didn't want to waste the cycle or her insurance money. And so sent her home to try naturally, which she'd been doing for eight years. And she got pregnant with a healthy baby boy at the age of 42, that cycle. Wow. And she's never, now she is strictly like she eats this way for the rest of her life because she's never felt better. So that's the other side of it too, is like, it's it, the baby of course is our goal, right? That's what everybody wants. But like what I'm doing and then in the work you're doing too, we're like, really, we're transforming these bodies and this health. 
And of course, is, is it the exact right diet for every single person? No, but that's why you do the elimination. Then you add back in, you start to figure out what works for you and your body versus I have to eat all these flax seeds every day because they're good for phytoestrogens. Do you know what I mean? Like well, flax seeds don't work for everybody. And if you have this certain genetic SNP, guess what? You get nothing out of flax seeds. Did you know that? You know what I mean? Has anyone talked to you about that? So it's like, I think, I think we're overgeneralizing at times and we can be missing the boat for some people. And so, yeah, I mean, I, and I just saw it so many times that I just started to get very fixated on, you know, we can really fine tune this even more. It's work. It's not, it's not super easy. Elimination diet is not easy, but it's not forever. And you, you get freedom in that because you get to then reintroduce and see how you feel. Mm -hmm. It's like you're, I mean, one of the things it's like, I don't know, giving people permission either or educating them. Like you don't have to live this way. Like you shouldn't be bloated and sick all the time. And we get into these habits, especially as we get older. And we just, um, I think, so my experience has been with a lot of women that, I mean, it's annoying to have to eat all the time. Like, I don't mean that, but I, what I mean is like, we're busy. We've got things to do. We've got responsibilities. And so eating becomes an additional responsibility. So we try to figure out how to get in whatever we need in our bodies, kind of like the analogy of gas in a car to just make it as easy as possible. And then we can get into a habit like that and just live that way for like five, 10 years of just basically eating the same kind of things all the time. Um, And meanwhile, all these kind of health issues start creeping up and you don't even it does like it doesn't even you don't occur. correlate it you yeah. don't correlate it and that's nobody's fault because no one's telling you to correlate it do you know what I mean it's just like right and you see it like if a woman comes to me and she's trying to get pregnant but nobody's looked at her thyroid and her TSH is super high you know what I mean like well that's not going to help the situation we've got to get that under control first right or she comes to me and she's like yeah but I have loose bowels every single day with undigested food particles okay so you're not absorbing your nutrition so I got to fix that first I can't just get you pregnant like I got to fix that first right so it's it is it's like stepping back first and looking at the whole picture and then and understanding like we know so much more now about the microbiome and its impact on all these things. And we know about the immune system and it's like from a fertility perspective, we know all this information now and there's really good science and really like astonishing stuff. And so we have to think about those in the, in the picture of this, like the body is saying, I look at it very plainly as like the body is saying, I don't have enough to make this baby. So I have to figure out where, where, where's the break in the system and how to fix that. Well, and I think be... a diet like this really is helpful because it's, it's, it's a way to empower yourself to see like you have a lot of control here. Well, yeah. And it shouldn't be a novel concept that your overall health is connected to your fertility. Oh I yeah. mean, it shouldn't, but it is for, for whatever is. reason, it's completely like, separate. Oh no, your fertility is based on your FSH and your AMH and your anthropopic Oh, and not the fact okay. that you don't have bowel movements regularly and that you feel yeah. like crap all the time. So, or you don't enjoy sex because your vagina is so dry and you know, like what? Or you're bleeding oh. all the time and yeah. you, no, and you have no one, no one, PMS talks about that. And no one ever said anything about that. But that's um, it. Yeah. So, I mean, hopefully with this conversation, I mean, other conversations we've had over the years, I'll make sure to to link our previous podcast episodes as well. For me, of course, the information is really important, but I feel like there's a bigger shift, hopefully, that we're encouraging in our culture of really focusing on health and understanding that these two things are related. And I'm so thankful for your contributions, all the work that you have done to raise awareness about this. As we wrap up today, could you let us know about the book, where we can get it? Just tell us all about the book. And it is called The Egg Quality Diet. Yes. And you can get it, I I think, pretty much anywhere books are sold at this point. We link through to it through Amazon for my website, which is amyrop.com. And yeah, that's, I think Amazon's the number one place where it is selling right now, but I know it's available in Barnes and Nobles and Target and all these other places as well. And get your copy and then let me know what you think. So there's also like with the book comes this resources page, which has like a video for each phase of the diet and like me cheering you on. And there's recipes and 
all the PDFs that are in the book are, are downloadable and you can print them out. There's shopping lists, there's recipes. I give you my best of my best, like curated content that goes along with the book. So if you want to know about what is the current science behind like epigenetics and egg quality, I have a video on that for you. If you want to know like, what can I do for sperm health? I have, I have information on that for you. Links out to the best supplements. So what I love about the book is I, I've created like, you know, it's its own website with it too. So there's, you get so much more than just the book when you, when you purchase the book. Amazing. Yes, well, Amy, amazing. Um, thank you so much for being on the show. Oh, and one more question. Where can people yeah. go to learn more about you and find you on social and, and all the places? Yeah. So, I mean, my website has all my things, amyrop.com, but I'm pretty active on Instagram and I kind of love it. And I go live every single week with free, you know, I do my lives every single week, free content, talking about all sorts of stuff, women's health, fertility, mental health, all of the things. And that's just um, at Amy Ralph. Awesome. On, on the gram. Yeah. Well, as always, it's always a pleasure speaking to you. <laughs> it's always Same. fun to have you on the show to share your wisdom. And I'm thrilled that we dove into boosting egg quality today. I'm sure that there were so many women who really wanted to hear this conversation. So thank you so much. Yeah. This has been great. Thank you, Lisa. Thank you so much. Thanks to everyone listening. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed today's show, please share it with a friend. You'll find the show notes page for today's episode over at fertilityfriday.com 384. I hope that you enjoyed today's episode. Always a pleasure to have Amy on the show. And of course, always important to learn about the different ways that we can improve egg quality and improve and optimize our chances of conception. One of the challenges I would say with egg quality is that unlike sperm parameters, there's no specific satisfying test in the same way. There's plenty of ways to gauge, generally speaking, the ovarian reserve parameters. However, with sperm, counts can look at numbers. We can get specific counts and percentages and, and very definite details. I think that's where charting comes in for a lot of women because as you improve the various aspects of your health, you often will see an improvement as well in your cycles, your hormone production, your luteal phase length, your cervical fluid quality and quantity and all of those types of things. So charting gives you an opportunity and way to track your progress in terms of your overall cycle health. So with that said, I hope you have a wonderful week, weekend, whenever you're tuning into the show. And of course, as always, until next time, be well and happy charting.